th thank you, Teresa. It's really interesting that uh, I've, I've just recently come back from four months at the Getty Conservation Institute in Los Angeles. And the, in, in the United States, they never, in any public event, acknowledge uh, the first owners of the land. And so, uh, and meeting some of the first people at uh, an exhibition uh, in, in LA, where Barbara Streisand was and DK of DKNY turned up, blah, blah, blah. It was very, very uh, much LA. And they did finger food. I got two fingers worth of food uh, for the whole evening. But, but one of the things was, one of the local Indians said, I wish I lived in Australia, because then at least we would be acknowledged. So there you go. That's something that at least in WA we can do it right. So what I want to do today is just give you a quick run through of some of the rock art sites, the different types of rock art that's around in WA and give you a bit of a feel for what some of the processes of deterioration are all about and how I as a you know, boring chemist went around solving the problems. And uh, if any of you know where Bolgart is, uh, it's up near Northern. And John Clark, who used to be the museum's rock art conservator, had tried uh, you, this. This is a big kangaroo, in case you can't see it. Um, uh, but the big kangaroo was all covered with lichen. And the lichen was destroying the granite and the engravings. And so he reckoned, right, well, lichen needs zinc, maybe we'll just give it a lot of zinc. And so he tried zinc sulfate, zinc fluoride, zinc this, zinc that. It really didn't matter. So we used the cheapest thing of all, zinc sulfate. And just painting a little bit of zinc sulfate on the uh, rock surface killed the lichen in a bio-friendly, environmentally friendly uh, fashion. And so it meant that the image was preserved. And so it was several years later when uh, I went to uh, Wave Rock and I saw this unusual you know, patination of the rock. And here you can see it in more detail. And of course, it's the zinc, because for occupational health and safety, you just stop people going, oh, I wonder where the air is. Uh, and, and falling over and killing themselves and making a real mess down below. Um, at least it's easy for, to, for FISA when bodies are dropped at the bottom of a cliff to pick them up. But anyway, they, I looked at it and here is the flow lines. This is where all the lichen has been killed off from the corrosion of when rain does occasionally come to Hyden and the galvanised iron fence posts and the galvanised mesh corrodes. So zinc corrosion products are generally water soluble and, and, and so it went and killed off the, um, the lichen on the rock. And so it's always a case of too much of something is not good for you. So it's a bit like St Paul said to Timothy, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. And yet, if you drink a bottle a night, you'll end up getting cirrhosis of the liver. So you've got to find a balance. And in conservation of the natural environment and working on shipwrecks and on rock art sites, it's a matter of finding that delicate balance point between uh, in subtle intervention or changing the environment so much that uh, a new problem suddenly emerges. Nearby, uh, up in the wheat belt, you've got, here are some examples of uh, typical uh, images that you might find. These uh, concentric uh, ochre circles deep inside a granite cave. And this is how the granite does you know, block weathering. And you just want to make sure that if you're camping, just look at the cap edging of the rocks because it is inadvisable on a frosty night 
to camp too close to those edges because all of a sudden they can just go boom. And if you want to know what it is like to have five and a half tons of rock drop on you in the middle of the night, uh, I would recommend you camp there. Um, but in this case, here are the hand stencils. And all throughout this cave, I mean, that's, that's Papa hand, Mama hand, and Baby's hand. And, and those hand stencils you know, made you chew up uh, the kaolin or you know, the, the, the clay that's there, put your hand there, and then just go <laughs> and blow the biggest, longest raspberry you can. And you leave your imprint there. And when it's properly cared for in the environment inside the shelter, some of these handprints in this cave have been dated at more than eight and a half thousand years old. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what nice, subtle way of saying, I was here. Uh, our current methods of saying, I was here, are uh, either building monstrous buildings on St. George's Terrace in the hope that it might be there in 60 years' time. So I think uh, they knew the better part. And of course here you've got a, a snake and a goanna joining together. And the person who started me off in rock art is this man, uh, John Clark, and that was me, uh, yeah, before I got old and, uh, and lost my beard and moustache. And th this is the rest of the team, and obviously working in uh, conjunction with indigenous elders who take you uh, to the sites because it's their country, you're working and walking on their land and so you need to be guided uh, by their experience and understanding of the uh, spirituality of the sites. And up, uh, it, if you go to Q, hands up those who've been to Q. Good, good West Australians. Um, it's, it's, it's magic country up at Kew. And up at Walga Rock, there are a whole series of images painted in the shelter here. This is original uh, vegetation. That's obviously original vegetation. But one of the, thing, one of the problems there was that uh, there are a lot of inherent fugitive that is reactive pigments like kaolinite, the white clay, calcite, calcium carbonate, and which are very prone to acid dissolution and being lost. Now, everyone normally says on archeological sites, look out for bird shit. I mean, sort of avian guano, but it's basically bird shit. And the birds would roost up here, and then occasionally it would rain, and the water would wash uh, the poo. Uh, down. And so these are basically poop lines uh, from birds, quite naturally occurring. But what was amazing was with the ochre pigments and you know, the rock art there is, is really quite very, very fine uh, paintings. But you can see these areas are where uh, little bits of the granite there, you can see it less active spalling. But this is where the solution weathering of the granite uh, gets in, it changes the minerals under the surface, the hydration changes, and then the new minerals underneath that little rock surface go badoing and blast the surface off. And so that's what's happening there. But one of the curious things was that right under the bird shit lines, for want of another word, uh, these white pigments were incredibly well preserved. And everyone had said initially, you've got to get rid of the birds, you, you, and you poison them. People said, oh, you, the best way to manage the rock art on this site is kill the birds. Well, if you're a kestrel or a sparrow hawk or a falcon, I mean, life's tough in the Murchison. And to have a rock art conservator going around with a gun, you, a 22, trying to shoot you or something is not nice. So we said, no, no, let's just understand what's going on. And in fact, what it was, was that acidic phosphates from the gua avian guano reacted with calcium carbonate to give you a different uh, 
calcium mineral, a calcium pyrophosphate, and the bicarbonate just washed away. And here you can see the surface pH of different parts of the rock. And right near the avian guano flow, the surface pH was you know, about 4.75, which is acidic enough to get these reactions. So what did we do with our mates in CSIRO? We went and got, I went to the zoo and got modern poo uh, from the same type of birds because the composition of poop uh, varies enormously uh, from bird to bird, just as it does from human to human, depending on your diet. Uh, and so what we did, we replicated uh, reacting the old guano or modern guano with the modern minerals and we were able to reproduce and get the same minerals turning up in our little accelerated experiment as the rock had gone and produced. And so we really are sure that this was the mechanism of preservation. And so the answer to that treatment was leave the birds alone, leave the rock alone. And in fact, the best thing uh, that we had to do was in the area in front of the cave, we modeled the amount of moisture uh, that was coming uh, in when during cyclonic rains and we just planted native plants that would grow to a specific height and we bought tanks and trickle fed them for five years and and that they then grew up and now the whole front of Wagga Rock is naturally protected uh, from cyclonic rain so you won't get any washing uh, away of the rock art because we planted native species that have very low evaporation and transpiration through their leaves. The moisture balance was modelled. Uh, the microclimate of the cave was modelled. The chemistry was understood. And so our intervention on that site was planting some trees. Uh, and so, but if you don't know what's going on, you can make mistakes. And the kaolinite, the aluminium hydroxysilicate, went with the bird guano uh, to a calcium uh, hydroxysilicate uh, and another different aluminium one. And so it went from being very subject to rapid expansion and falling off to being a very stable mineral. So uh, people were amazed. They said, and you got $24,000 from Aetsis in Canberra to study the reactions of avian guano? Yeah, where's the sense in that? But at least we can tell people, if you've got bird poop on a site, just check your reactions. If we go and move up, up the coast and up into the Kimberley, uh, this is the view uh, I took from the helicopter window in the wet season. Uh, uh, this is the Napier Ranges. It's dead flat on either side. Why? Because this used to be the seabed. And in an ancient times, this was, in fact, a coral reef. So if you want to know, if you don't like diving, and you want to know about the structure of a coral reef, just you know, fly or drive up to Derby, go out to the Napier Ranges and walk around. And you never run out of air, uh, never get the bends, and, and you'll get to see some of the most magic countryside in WA. And naturally, uh, areas like this shelter would have been cut in uh, by waves into, into, the, into the reef structure. And so Aboriginal people for roughly 28,000 years had been painting uh, images up here. And this is a highly sophisticated method of holding our senses uh, up against uh, the rock surface, which means you get a machete and you find a little sapling and you just go whack, whack, and, and cut a pole and then chuck, chuck, cut a little chisel point in the top and then just bend it down, put your thermocouple up the top and then gently release it and it goes and kisses the rock art surface. And it's fully reversible, totally green, literally green, and uh, it's, it's a nice way to do things. And one of the things 
everyone said was, oh, everything will be happening in the wet season. Nothing happens in the dry. Well, that's a load of cobblers. It's all happening in different ways in the, in the wet and in other ways in the dry. And what we found was in the dry season, the amount of moisture coming in uh, varies. You, you can get little moist fronts. And then what happens is all of a sudden, zoom, these desiccated rock surfaces go water. Oh, 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 that was good. And as a result, you all of a sudden desiccated surfaces become hydrated. And therefore the pigments bonded to that desiccated rock surface suddenly swell and change their profile and can then go ping, ping, ping and fall off. And so uh, we were able, in fact, to pick up uh, nighttime heating from some of these surfaces. Now, the amount of cooling you normally get depends on the so-called sky view factor, the amount of radiative bits of sky that you can, the, the long wave radiation can see. The more the sky you can see, the faster you will cool. And that's why at home, if you've got a carport, your car never has dew on it because uh, the amount of sky that the car can see is small and therefore uh, the rate at which it will cool is small and so therefore corrosion on your car and deterioration of your paint is minimised because you've got a low sky view factor. Do not put your car in a lock-up garage in the winter unless you want to have accelerated decay. But that's another story, you can ask me about that later. What date was that? Hmm? What, this? Yeah. This work, uh, we were up here, this photo was taken in 1992. And anyway, what we found was that sometimes there was nighttime heating. And, and I looked at the results because I love plotting things. And, and sometimes the rate was faster and slower. And so what we did, we multiplied the uh, relative humidity by the absolute vapour pressure of water at that temperature to find the real partial pressure of water, the number of millimetres of mercury water pressure there. And we found that the rate of cooling and heating was dependent on the vapour pressure of water. And so at as we plotted the rate against vapour pressure of water, boom, there was a result. The reason why we were getting nighttime heating of 0 0.032 degrees per hour, not much, but measurable, was because a moist front happened to be passing through the Kimberley at the time, and the rock went <laughs> And as it condensed the moisture on the rock surface, the water gave off its latent heat of condensation and surface increased in temperature. So, you know, I mean, talk about sensitive. You may think that chemists are non-sensitive, non-caring people that just destroy the environment. I tell you what, armed with proper data loggers and really good thermocouples, we are very sensitive. <laughs> and there's my colleague, uh, Phil Haydock, looking a bit tired, I think, uh, there. And that, that three fingers in the air means it's the third roll of film um, you know, uh, make it a register of it and and there's Phil attaching one of the sensors uh, climbing up on uh, a little ladder but when you have to carry everything in or chopper it in uh, you become very adept at uh, if necessary climbing on each other's shoulders to go and attach sensors up in the roof of caves but the advantage of it is we know what's going on now. And so there you can see uh, one of the thermocouples uh, right against the rock surface and the RH probe taped to the top of the trick stick. And there you can see uh, an, an image with partially covered with calcium carbonate because these are limestone cliffs and uh, as solution weathers but here's a nice crocodile, and there's uh, a wandjana, and it's, in fact, 
this white pigment of the wandjina is a calcium magnesium carbonate that's got three magnesiums and one calcium in it. It's very unusual. And guess where? It's found in WA. And that mineral huntite has been traded as far north as northern Queensland uh, that has come from a Kimberley uh, mineral site. And I mean, it's a long way to walk to get your white pigment. But what happens is this pigment, when the relative humidity gets over 56%, it's normally lying there, uh, and pigment. Humidity comes and the pigment swirls and becomes bigger and fatter as it absorbs multiple layers of moisture. And this two-dimensional pigment becomes three-dimensional. And so the wandjina goes from being flat to fully engorged and alive. And shortly after, the rains come. Because the wandjina spirit is the spirit that brings the rains in the wet season and the life and the hope uh, of new, new, new everything to the Kimberley. And of course, you can say, well, it's just a chemical reaction of the huntite pigment swelling you know, as the moist fronts come in as a harbinger of the wet season. Or you can say, there's real power there. Uh, and one of the simple ways of protecting these repainted images uh, from cattle is whack a barbed wire fence in front of it. Because animals, you know, when, you, when you're a cow, I mean, you imagine being a cow or a bull, you know, and you've got an itchy back, you know, it's a little bit hard you know, to get the back of your hoof up. And, or if you've got two itchy points, you get two legs up and you fall down flat in your face. And so therefore, that's why cattle always go and rub their backs or their bottoms against nice rocks in a cave. Well, if the cave happens to be an Aboriginal rock art site, the images can get seriously abraded. And because there was still cattle on this station that hadn't been cleared, uh, the simplest form of site protection was just whack up a fence. And that stopped the physical abrasion of the paintings. And these, these images had been repainted uh, just four or five years before this photograph was taken in 1990. And people, there was a lot of controversy because this is up near Mount Barnett at the time. And someone said, the Aboriginal people are destroying these ancient rock art images. This is desecration. It should be stopped. They, you know, they don't know what they're doing. The person making that noise was trying to sell his station at the time and promoting the value of these ancient rock art images uh, on his land. So, of course, he had a commercial interest in it. But our analysis of some of the layers in these uh, cave paintings and sites shows that they've been repainted 10, 20, 30 times over maybe 15, 25,000 years. It is all part of the whole symbolism of the spiritual power of the site, calling the elders to go and repaint them and revitalize them. It's the world's oldest living culture, and we're living right in the heart of it, if we only look. And so up in the Mitchell Plateau, uh, you've got lots of, of wanderers, and you know, there you can see the you know, tail of a kang big kangaroo, and you can see the uh, areas where the huntite pigment has, has been, been coming away. And one of the reasons this grey-black material in there was the calcium oxalate mineral huolite, uh, spelt waywolite, and it was there as a result of biological activity. Plants are are not like dogs. I had to walk my sister's dog the other morning at six o'clock, Mount Henry Bridge. So it drops stuff and you have your plastic bag and you pick it up. But with plants, do we know? Do we know what plants do? 
with this stuff, their leftover stuff. No, we don't. Why? Because it's normally hidden. And, and, and you can't see the minerals because they go back into the ground. But in a rock art site, with plants living on top of you, where do the plant metabolites go? Out, down, onto the rock surfaces. And so oxalates, which are inherently toxic to plants, the plants go, I didn't want you, and they get rid of them. And the oxalates react with the calcium carbonate pigments and form a very stable uh, calcium oxalate. Now you might say, well look, you, what you should do is get rid of this stuff because it's not original. But what was the most extraordinary chemistry up in the Kimberley, in the sandstone uh, country, was that the rate at which these reactions happened, you got what is chemically called isomorphic, yeah, isomorphic replicates of the original painted surface. But so the, hunt, the huntite, very reactive calcium magnesium carbonate, turned into totally unreactive calcium oxalate and retained the image. Wow! Oh, I mean, that's, I mean, everywhere in Europe, in you, their caves in Spain, in France, uh, problems with Nefertiti's tomb in Egypt and so on. You've got oxalates destroying images. Ha! Kimberley, different story. On some of these sites, the rate of evaporation, the rate of reaction, everything was just absolutely perfect to get preservation of these painted images. And although we haven't done any uh, dating of these images because uh, the elders said it is culturally inappropriate, we don't want them dated, so we didn't because they know it was their ancestors who painted it and so therefore we know that, good enough for us. I mean, who wants to know? I mean, what's the difference? Does, if this is 28,000 years old and this is 32,000 years old, does it make it any more significant culturally, spiritually? No, doesn't matter what. However, uh, for archeologists who like, really like dating things, uh, they were able to dig up some charcoal uh, in the site, uh, which they were given permission to, and they got dates of 28 to 32,000 years. And so what you're looking at is the oldest evidence of human decoration and response and cultural expression in an art form uh, that's known in the world. And where is it? in WA. And what are we doing it with it? We're looking after it. And so uh, there's one of the elders, that, but look at, look at this site. You know, look at, look at all, all the wantonness all, all over the place and all the different designs. And there you could see lots of data logging. And why did I know to get into micro meteorology? And that was because I used to work at Murdoch, uh, in my, my before museum days, and I met there my first micrometeorologist, Professor Tom Lyons, and he taught me all about microclimates in suburbs and vegetation and how you can alter water balance and energy balance. So I got one of his students on uh, when I got money for a grant, and so we began to study the micrometeorology of these rock art sites. And as a result, we actually understand what's going on. And more importantly, we have been able to m model the energy balance on these rock art sites and predict temperatures and heating and cooling profiles for when we're not there. And so we know what stresses the rock art is going under and therefore we can go back periodically and monitor it and then we got a better idea of how to manage these things into the future when I'm you know, no longer in the museum because you know, I'll be gone in a few years. You know? I mean, we all have to go. And, um, but the rock art 
you want to make sure that it's got the best chance of living on. And so that's why we work the way we do. Now, slipping along into the burrow, uh, this is the so-called uh, climbing man panel. And you know, these are men climbing up the trees of life and with animals there to support them. And one of the things was a lot of stuff was being said that, oh, the emissions from you know, the Woodside gas plant, sorry, <clears throat> correct that, the emissions from a significant industrial complex in the area uh, were causing irreversible damage to the rock art. And, and I said, well, what's the pH like? What's, what's the surfaces like? And every question I asked, I got the classic aquatic zoological response. <laughs> Don't know. I said, well, let's find out. So we did. And, you know, this is the image that you will see people against industry showing, you know, mass, and they will say, massive pollution, you know, in the burrup caused by industrial plants. And it, it is smoky, and it does look sort of scary. But this is a flare tower. When you are processing gas and oil, there are some very nasty, toxic, biologically produced materials. The safest way is to kill those nasty chemicals by burning them. So when you get a build-up of these nasty gases, they just get vented through the top of the tower and and they're all gone, safe and sound. So not a problem. So next time you see a flare tower, don't think nasty, nasty, thank you. Say thank you, Mr. Flare Tower, for stopping me breathing in those nasty toxic compounds that nature has made. Uh, and here, this is me down below. Uh, why, you, you might ask, am I wearing uh, a shade over my neck? And that's because it's very hot up there. And I'm very prone to sunstroke. And I don't like vomiting for 24 hours on a three-day field trip, as I've done in the past. So anyway, this is in uh, obviously close proximity to Woodside plant. And so we decided to find out what's going on. So we took samples of the yeast, molds, and fungi over set areas on the rock surfaces and whack them into ice buckets, which we would then uh, take back and keep cold and fly down to Perth. And you can see it's hot, uh, it's sweaty. Look at the veins sticking out in my pores. Uh, yeah, temperature, 25 is in the middle of the night. 55 degrees in the shade is when you're doing your measurements in the middle of the day. It's hot. And if you accidentally squat down in your shorts and the back of your legs hits the rocks uh, in the sun, the temperatures can be 60, 65, enough to cook an egg, and you quickly move. Um, but we took, took our samples. And being a chemist, I measured the surface chloride uh, and then measured the surface pH. And in the burrup, instead of being a painted image, what you've got is these weathered uh, gabbro and granophyre rocks have got a natural red-brown crust on them. So the rock art is made by engraving that crust away and showing up the lighter colour of the parent rock. And so then as the rock ages, the brightness, if you like, of that engraving gradually diminishes with time. And so you need to be at, the, at a surface at the right time of day with the right amount of breaking light coming in to see a lot of the images. But nevertheless, they're there and they're real. And you might say, that's a funny form of subtle intervention, painting a number three on a rock. And that's because the rocks that we were doing measurements on in this museum compound were relocated rocks from you know, 25, 30 years ago during the first stage of development up there when the idea was, well, you want to save the rock art, you just grab it and put it in a compound, put a fence around it, and it'll be kept safe. 
And so we were checking uh, how are the museum rocks performing. And one of the other things was, yeah, I went and washed rocks. I mean, you might say, you are seriously sick. Who on earth would want to wash rocks? Well, I did, because I wanted to know what is on the surface of the rocks. Because we've, we've got bug counts, we've got pH, we've got chloride, but what else is there? So we would go and collect standard amounts of water uh, from reaction with various rock surfaces and analyze them by ion chromatography, uh, inductively coupled plasma mass spec you know, for low concentrations of metals, and we got some data together. And to make sure that we got some reference material, we went way, way out into the Dampier Archipelago to remote islands well away from where the winds would blow any industrial emission and took samples of pH, chloride, rock surfaces, bug counts and everything. And this is up in Mermaid's Hand. And look, it's, if you ever get the chance, go. It is just simply beautiful country. And, and so pH is balanced in part. The acid from the metabolites is balanced out by the seaborne salts because as the wind comes in, it blows salty air over the rock surfaces. And as salt water concentrates, it becomes more alkaline. And so it acts as a natural you know, balancing effect to biological decay. And what we found was a very nice correlation between the mean pH of the rocks and the amount of chloride. So low, high chloride, it was you know, a more alkaline surface. And uh, you can see the pHs were getting, um, some of them in some areas, relatively acidic. And that's because of the biological activity. And you know, the reason why you have these different, same slope, 0 0.022, 0 0.021, 0 0.023, 0 0.024. Look at those uh, correlation coefficients. I mean, non-rig data. I mean, this is natural environmental data with R squared values greater than 0.98. It's you know, simply brilliant. You can't argue with it. And the reason why you have these parallel lines, different intercepts, is you're seeing different rock surfaces. All the rocks don't have the same weathered surface. They have different mineralogies, and therefore they will be reacting in different ways to the different populations of yeast, mold, and fungi on them. So if anyone says, oh, it's all the same, don't you believe it? The rocks in the burrup are as basically different as all of you. Now, look, see, I've got the advantage, like in a pulpit, you can see everyone in the congregation. And uh, it is seriously scary. First time I preached, never again did I slouch in a pew. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, if you look after the talk at all of you, you'll see you're very different. All basically the same, bits you know, put together, but wonderfully different. Well, so it is with the rocks. And you, that's why the uh, way in which they weather, uh, the acidity they build up, it's all dependent on their past history. And w we were literally staggered. Sorry, this is a bit bright to read these numbers, but you've got pHs basically round about vinegar level um, on the surface of these rocks, some of these ancient rock engravings. This engraving has been dated to about 22,000 years. You can just you know, still make it out. It's very weathered. And so we thought, holy whoop, we have a really major problem. But no, when I looked at the pH at one of these remote control sites, we had very similar values. And why? Because a euro, you know, a little you know, boing, 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 a you know, little thing that goes boing across the rocks, had been pooping and peeing uh, on, the, on that engraving. And so the yeast, mold, and fungi, they didn't care whether, whether the nitrates 
and, uh, and urea and so on came from industrial pollution or from nature, they just said, ho, 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 love this. <laughs> it was just like fertilising your lawn with some super duper product from Bunnings or something, you know, and all of a sudden it goes from brown to green. Um, well, the same thing happens with rocks. So what we found was that the most acidic surfaces could be close to the industrial plant or they could be miles away. And in the miles away ones, it was the natural material coming from the natural animals that was causing the local increase in nutrients. So it's not as simple as you make out. And what we found was that if we look at the number of bacteria, here 600, oh, no, 60,000 of them, 50,000, and the pH, as the number of bacteria increased, the acidity of the rock surface uh, increased. And again, the parallel lines reflect the different geology of the rock surfaces. So we knew that the acidity was coming not from SOx, not from you know, NOx pollution, it was coming from naturally occurring yeasts, mould and fungi. And the night before I was doing a lot of measurements, there's a beautiful kangaroo engraving on one of the rocks in the borough. Pat Vinicom said to me, just care for my rocks, will you? And then the next morning she died. And so that's why I'm a bit passionate about the borough because I've got to do the work that Pat had done years ago in documenting the rock art. I've got to make sure that her legacy lives on. So rest us all in peace. And we found there was a direct relationship between the log of the bacteria and the amount of nitrate. So it doesn't matter what the source of nitrate is, whether it's natural or from pollution or whatever, the more nitrate on the surface, the more bugs and therefore the more acid. And you can look here at the different surfaces of the rocks and they look, you can see there, some are much more friable, others uh, have different mineralogy and so therefore uh, the reactivity of the surfaces varies enormously. But what is amazing is if you come up here and put little gold microelectrodes on the surface and measure the resistivity between underneath the crust and that even on a stinking hot day when it might be 55, the rock surface is still moist enough to keep yeast, mould and fungi alive and active up until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so it's always the micro environment. You know, those bugs, they've been around for millions of years. And you, they're not going to sit on the top of the rock in the middle of the day. They're not dumb. They just go, <laughs> I know where to hide. <laughs> oh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> and then they just go, OK, we'll wait for the night, fellas. <laughs> then we'll do our stuff. And so uh, again, that's the pH with the nitrate. And here is, we found the nitrate concentrations highest around Withnal Bay, but also right up here, there was some also very high nitrate concentrations. And what was interesting was we, the, there's no essential sulfur dioxide from the industrial plants. But there are sulfates, extra sulfates coming onto some of the rock surfaces. And we thought, where from? Well, out there on West Intercourse Island, you can just see uh, there was a little oil rig just floating around off there. But that's where they load the big ships. And the iron ore ships burn cheap bunker fuel. And it's, it's dirty, mucky, sticky oil, which is high in sulphur. And we were able to pick up in our rock surface analyses the difference between where the wind had blown 
the fuel, the exhaust from the iron ore ships uh, and, and where it hadn't. And that's the reason why I was dumb enough to go and wash the rocks and analyse them because you never know what you're going to find. And so that's the results with the sulphates. And this shows you uh, what happens when an engraving is left facing up towards the sky instead of in a vertical position. When you're facing up, you say, OK, hit me! And so the sun comes whack, and then the wind comes whack, and then when it rains, it comes Whereas if you're on a nice vertical surface, which you were originally, ah, you suffer much less deterioration. So it was as a result of our work, we said these rocks need to be reoriented. So what have they done? They've reoriented them back into the original aspect and the rate of deterioration has really slowed down. Simple. And what we were able to do was by going back at different seasons, you know, there in the winter, you know, and that was in the summer in February, uh, and in August, in the springtime, what, what we were able to show on the same rock uh, was that there are natural seasonal variations in acidity, and it's all to do with the availability of moisture, and, so, and it's, it's all part of the natural environment in the burrup. And no one knew that before we went up there, because no mad chemists were available. And so what we're able to see was that in some areas where, where there was, um, you know, on, on various rocks, there was uh, sometimes a decrease in acidity following the rain, and that's because the rain washed the micronutrients off the rock surface. So no nutrients, biological activity down, you, uh, acidity goes back uh, to being more, more neutral. And look at this uh, for, for reproducibility. Three different rock surfaces with pH profiles uh, on them. So you, many people would say, well, how reproducible is your data? It's very reproducible. And there you can see the engraving of, uh, the, the, that's the tail of a dugong. And so what we found was it's all very sensitive to moisture levels. And so we're up there in the summer and one of my doubting colleagues went and said to me, OK, Ian, you go to St George's Cathedral, just pray for rain. I said, it doesn't work like that. You, know, you can't sort of try and trick God into giving you optimal research conditions, it uh, doesn't work. And he said, just try it. And so three days later, all of a sudden, out of the middle of nowhere, <laughs> this unexpected thunderstorm came through. So we sort of raced back and went out and resampled you know, the rocks and remeasured pH and remeasured this and that. And as a result, we found that don't worry about these ups and downs, but the main thing to note is that in some areas, where, like here, uh, this is the number of yeast and mould counts. Before the rain, it was 144. Uh, t less than 24 hours afterwards, the number of yeast, mould and fungi counts had gone up to 402. Um, this site uh, was sheltered and didn't get any rain. That got some rain, and this one, up at King Bay, right up on the edge of the peninsula, got plenty of rain, um, and and it it this is in the summer, but it was not too much rain to wash off the nutrients, but it was enough to basically double uh, the biological activity. So water is one of the critical factors in controlling biodeterioration of rock surfaces in the borough, and so. My colleague Warren Fish um, was there, Mans Lofgren, and this is um, 
Hearson's Cove, and just around the corner is uh, the site of much of this beautiful rock art. And so part of the government's work, I've set up, helped set up the Bar Rock Art Monitoring Committee. So we've got weather stations uh, all, all throughout the Barrap and a reference point down at Mardi Station. Uh, and... Oh, they have, all right, yeah. Well, we set them up anyway. And um, we did the monitoring and one of the problems you have in rock art sites in different parts of WA is ignorance. And in this site up in the wheat belt, uh, you had you know, land rights for whites, etc. You can read it. And so what we did, we used nice uh, combination of cocktail of solvents and removed the graffiti and rubbed uh, dirt back into the rock surface to remove the uh, residue of the paint and as John Clark said the best protection for a rock art site is being more than uh, 500 metres from a four wheel drive access track. Um, isolation is the best protection but also if you do get graffiti on a site get rid of it um, because it only encourages you know, people to do it again. And that ladies and gentlemen is the end of my little travelogue of uh, rock art. Thank you.